I need to alert you to the fact that uh, now that you've found Acts chapter 18, I'm warning you, we're going to go three other places. Don't go there yet, but just be ready. So I don't want to freak you out when I say, now turn here, okay? Now, we're also going to be looking at 1 Corinthians, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be looking at Numbers 6. Hey, that's one you probably haven't read recently, but maybe you have, depending upon your Bible reading plan. Acts chapter 18, we're going to jump right into the scripture here first. Acts 18, verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Notice, not a dream, a vision. There are differences. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, or in Greek it's the bima seat saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Paul remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a, lo a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, and had gone up, meaning gone up to Jerusalem to pay his vows, and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. Now that last sentence there in verse 23 means a lot in just a few little words because if you know where those regions are, it's basically he's going back for his third missionary journey and he's going back through modern day Turkey in the areas of Galatia and Phrygia, places where he had already established churches on the earlier missionary journeys and he took off again. So it, it, time wise, there's just one verse, but there's a lot of stuff in there. He went, he spent some time in 
uh, Jerusalem, as we will find he spent at least 30 days there. Then he went up to Antioch, his home church, and hung out there for a while. And it, there's a good reason to believe he spent months there, maybe even a year, when you compare the whole history of Paul, which we won't do today. And then he took off again. And we will hear uh, his third missionary journey as we get into uh, the latter part of chapter 18 and into chapter 19, which uh, I was telling Roger this morning, chapter 19 of the book of Acts is my favorite book, a favorite chapter in the book of Acts. So maybe that's a teaser for you to read ahead, Acts 19. It's a great, great chapter. And so is chapter 18, where we are today. So here's Paul. It says in verse 1, after these things, he departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Let's consider for a moment what these things are and the state of mind of the Apostle Paul. You know, when you read the Bible, you see the stories of these guys that are just phenomenal. I mean, come on, Paul, blinded on the Damascus road and then receives his sight and then is just preaching and seeing awesome, amazing miracles and all kinds of things. And we think, man, not Paul, man, nothing, nothing bums him. No, he's a human being. You see, here's the thing about, that I've realized about reading about some of the characters in the Bible is if you take all of the information that we know about Paul and put it in one place, it, it accounts maybe for a long span of his life, but only a very small portion of the time of his life. He was a human being. He got up in the morning and had, well, I don't know, they didn't brush their teeth back in that way. He had to, no, they didn't take showers either, did they? But he had to do something when he got up and eat and go through the day, and he went to work. When he got to Corinth, he found Aquila and Priscilla, and basically what it tells us here is he found a job. They hired him as a tent maker because they were tent makers. They were already there, having been kicked out of Rome, which is an interesting story. <laughs> because uh, there was an edict by Claudius, the Roman emperor, to force the Jews from the city of Rome. And it is recorded by Sidonius, I think it is, one of the Roman historians about 70 years after it happened, and he recounts the fact that in about, I think it was A.D. 46, 49, I forget now, it's a 40-something, that Claudius kicked out all of the Jews because of the instigations brought up by Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, -E is the uh, transliteration into English from the uh, Latin, and some people think, oh, well, maybe there was some guy named Crestus who was raising a bunch of uh, problems and so forth, but most scholars believe that it's actually a mistake of recounting Christ, Christos, and that the problems and riots that were happening was because of what was happening with Paul in Turkey as he's going into synagogues and he's proclaiming Christ and then the Jews are getting all riled up and they're, they're arguing back and forth and right here in Corinth, they take, they take Paul before the proconsul of all of Achaia and he says, look, you guys are arguing about your own religion. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Go figure it out yourself. But Claudius, there was so much commotion it kicked him out. So it's interesting because we don't know whether Priscilla and Aquila were Christians before they met Paul or after. They might have been Christians already, and so they left Rome and they went to Corinth, large city, a uh, good commercial city, good place to do tent making. Or maybe this little short tent maker rabbi guy named Paul came and started working for him. And you spend 12, 15, 18 hours a day sewing up tents together. You think Paul might have told them about Jesus? You think maybe every day he told them about Jesus? Yeah, I think so. So either way, it's obvious later on as we get into the books of Acts, they are Christians. But what about Paul coming from Athens into Corinth? Let's think about a couple of things here. First of all, Corinth, large city, large commercial city. I think last week I incorrectly said that Athens was uh, the, the other large commercial city besides 
uh, Thessalonica in Greece. That's wrong. It's Corinth, not Athens. Athens actually, by the time of this time, was relatively small, though it was a center of uh, intelligentsia and academics, so to speak, because of its history. Uh, Corinth was a major city for a long time during the Greek Empire. Major city. Then in 146 BC, they rebelled against the Romans and they were, the city was totally destroyed. I mean, nothing left. Then a hundred years later, one of the emperors, I think it was Augustus, decided to rebuild it and rebuild it to bigger than its former glory. It was known back in the Greek days and during the Roman days as just a licentious, evil city. Have you ever heard the expression thrown around in our day, hey, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, right? It means all that you can go to Las Vegas and you can sin all you want and nobody will tell anybody. Well, you do know that's a lie, right? Because God knows already. So just in case you were wondering about that fact, theologically speaking, God knows. But it was the same thing for Corinth. There were expressions of the day about Corinth. If you talked about he had, that man had a Corinthian wife with him, it meant he had a prostitute with him, not that he had a wife who was from Corinth. If they talked about, oh, you're getting Corinthianized, it meant you were becoming a drunk and sexually immoral. It was a common expression throughout the Greek and Roman empires. Back in the days during the Greek empires and the great Greek tragedies and plays that were going on, if there ever was a person on the stage who was supposed to be from Corinth, he was always drunk. This is the idea of this town. Now you've maybe heard in people talking about uh, Corinth that it was one of the main uh, idols that they worshipped there was Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love and sexual uh, prowess. And there was a huge temple there and in the days a thousand temple priestesses would come down, essentially prostitutes for free, and every night come down into the city to ply their trade, no trade because there was no money involved. And so very licentious. Well, those thousand priestesses slash prostitutes were in the old Corinth. In the new Corinth, the temple was bigger. So it can only be assumed that there were probably more than a thousand by then. This is the kind of city that this short little Jewish rabbi raised as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He described himself as, as all things pertaining to the law, blameless. But Paul knew he wasn't justified by that, but he was saying, hey, look, I kept the law. I kept my morality. I kept my holiness. I kept separate from the Gentiles. And now here he comes. He's been a believer for a while, good long while, but here he comes. And that's still his nature of purity and holiness. And he comes into one of the most licentious, immoral cities in the whole Roman Empire. It's got to be affecting him a bit. But wait, there's more. Remember his journey to get to this place. He'd gone through uh, what is now modern-day Turkey, seen some horrible things, been stoned and left for dead. Not only would that rattle your mind, that would do a number on your body as well. He gets up and goes back into the city and then goes on to the next place. When he goes into Macedonia... He goes into Philippi. Things are going pretty well. Wow, this woman gets released from a demon, from demonic possession. But that had enabled her to do certain magic tricks and tell the future for her masters because she was a slave. And they grab Paul and bring him, be bring him before the magistrate up there. And what happens? He and Silas get beaten, get whipped, get thrown into prison hey, now that's not really a whole lot of fun. God delivers, and we like to focus on, the, man, they're singing praises in the prison. That Paul, he's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing that he would do that, but that's a matter of choice. You know, you don't sing involuntarily. You sing by choice. 
Many times, there are times when in the midst of being in a prison or prison-like environment, you need to choose to sing even though you don't really feel like it. I don't know if they felt like singing that night, but they were singing, no doubt about it, and the Lord delivered them. Awesome, but then they leave that town, they get down into Thessalonica, spend a short period of time, people are getting saved, and what happens? The Jews come against them violently and chase them out of town, go into Berea. Things are happening. Hey, these people are more noble than the people in Thessalonica. They're reading their Bible afterwards and say, well, Paul, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm going to check my Bible about that, see if you know what you're talking about. Stays for a while, things grow. What happens? The Jews from Thessalonica come down and chase him out. There's a pattern here. It's what happened in western Turkey. He gets down into Athens, seeks to talk to the intelligentsia, he does a wonderful job of speaking to them. But you know what's absent in the story of going to Athens? doesn't say anything about a church being established there. It says some believed. It names a few. But it doesn't give the impression that there was a large gathering or a church that was established there. No history of that, at least from the book of Acts. So now he heads over to Corinth, this horrible city, large city, horrible city what do you think was going through his mind all of these things coming to him paul is a human being now it's time to go to first corinthians first corinthians chapter three i believe it is Sorry, chapter 2. Chapter 2. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians some years later after the church was established and um, he was over in Ephesus by this time on his third missionary journey and he's writing to them. And listen to what he says in chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This experience from Athens got to him. That's where the wisdom of man was tantamount. This was the place of wisdom of man. And you get the feeling that Paul's feeling kind of dejected when he leaves Athens and goes to Corinth because little work was done and the wisdom of man was keeping these people in chains and not seeing the fantastic fruit of deliverance by Jesus Christ. It's one of the challenges of academia. Hey, you heard me, with, I think it was just last week. Use your brain. God gave it to you. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the academic world is a challenge to the Christian because the majority of the academic world stands against supernatural events or people or things at all. It focuses on the natural. I always say to, to people talking about, well, why can't science figure out where, where the world came from? I said, it's easy. It's easy. One of the foundational principles that you probably learned in grade school science is what? Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, can only change form. Well then, they can't figure out how it all got here from nothing, right? It's outside of the box built to study. Academia can be a challenge to a young person coming out of a sheltered Christian home. Not having been confronted at all with the challenges and thoughts and ideas of this day. We need to teach our children the truth, 
But we need to let them know that there are others who don't teach the truth and be ready to hear that and not be enticed by it. And yet we can't just keep them in a little box. God will care for them. See, so care for every one of you. And there are a lot of great minds in this room. And I don't say that uh, as a joke. I mean that. I know the education and the capability of many of you in this room. And God kept you. Maybe it was tough. Maybe he yanked you out of the fire, but he kept you and you are here. So it's possible. But we need to equip our children. But here's Paul coming. And I can imagine on that, that walk from Athens to Corinth, he's thinking, man, human wisdom is keeping people from the truth. And I wasn't able to do much of anything there. What else might have been on his mind. Well, it says he was there in great fear and trembling. We'll come back to that in a minute. There's one more. He's worried about the churches that he's establishing. He's seen this pattern. He gets chased out of Thessalonica, right? And what happens? He doesn't know. The Jews from Thessalonica are so mad they come to Berea to chase him out of there, then they go back home. What happened to all the people in Thessalonica? You know, he couldn't check Facebook to find out. <laughs> there was no word there. So turn to the right a couple of books. First Thessalonians, short book, so you might pass it if you're uh, quick on the draw there with your fingers. But First Thessalonians. And we're going to kind of jump hip, uh, hip scotch. <laughs> hmm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> we're going to try kind of hopscotch through bits of chapter 2 and chapter 3. This is Paul's letter uh, to the Thessalonians that he wrote while in Corinth later in his stay. It says, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our heart. And then uh, we'll skip down verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God, meaning he didn't collect monies from them while he was there. He evidently worked to be able to provide food for himself and preached as well. Verse 13, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. They do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see you to see your face with great desire therefore we wanted to come to you even i paul time and again but satan hindered us for what is our hope or joy or crown or rejoicing is it not even you in the presence of our lord jesus christ that is coming for you are our great glory and joy. So I imagine on him, maybe even on the boat between uh, Berea and getting down to Athens, Paul is thinking about, man, I wonder what's going on up there in Thessalonica. 
man, I really want to see those people. Man, they just love the Lord. And then I got chased out of town and some nasty people there. What's happening to them? His heart was yearning to see them. And look at this. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. You see, Paul, the Timothy and Silas met up with Paul in Athens. It's not recorded there, but it says when, he, when the guys from Berea dropped him off in Athens, he said, go back and tell Silas and Timothy to come as soon as they can, because he left them in Berea to establish that church. Well, evidently they came back, to, and, and he sent them from Athens, so now he's in Athens alone sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we're appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as has happened and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Now it goes on to say, and then Timothy came. It was so great. I heard what's going on. But as he's going from Athens to Corinth, he hasn't heard that yet. So this is his state of mind as he's coming into this city. He's seeing this horrible, evil, licentious city. He's considering what perhaps he felt a failure in Athens, in not being able to break through the wisdom of man by the wisdom of God. And he's considering that his own countrymen, his own people, are out to kill him and chasing him from town to town in order to keep him from having influence. And then he's suffering in the, in the effects of being stoned and left for dead, of being beaten and whipped in Thessalonica or in Philippi and that physical thing and he's coming into Corinth so as we go back to the book of Acts that's the mental state that Paul is in as he's coming into Corinth and he meets Priscilla and Aquila and he goes to work and he starts going into the synagogue and I want you to notice something here verse 4 it says and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now we talked about reasoning, even going into the synagogues and reasoning, and then into the marketplace in Athens and reasoning, using his brain, using his rationality to argue in the classical sense about why Jesus is the Christ. So he reasoned in the synagogue, but there's something that happens here. There's something that happens. I, I do think it interesting Notice verse 5, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, this is them coming, and Timothy saying, Paul, you're not going to believe the church in Thessalonica, man. They are growing. The Lord is just blessing them. They're wondering about, they're looking for the coming of the Lord, and some of the people have died in their fellowship, and they're thinking, did those people miss it because they died? And so Paul answers that question in First and Second Thessalonians. But he says later in the book of First Thessalonians, my joy, my crown, I'm so psyched that you are doing so well. The Lord is keeping you. So here this wonderful thing happens in that way. Okay, then he gets chased. So uh, when he had come, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. This is different. Reasoning and testifying are two different things. When you reason with someone, you use logic. You, you think about what they are thinking, what their line of logic is in why they believe what they believe, and you challenge them on that. Or better yet, you encourage them to think through their own reasoning of where they are and show them the fallacy of that and lead them rationally and reasonably to the Lord. That's reasoning. Testifying is declaring. When you go into court, unless you're an expert witness to testify, you don't go in there to tell them what you think. That's not allowed in court. That's just your opinion. 
What you're called to do is to come in and say what you know. And that's what Paul started doing. There's a change here from reasoning to testifying, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, compelled by the Spirit, it says. Compelled by the Spirit. And he testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him, okay, you can reason all you want, and we'd love to argue with you, Paul, but you start testifying that Jesus is the Messiah, we oppose you, and blaspheme now they they can't blaspheme paul they're blaspheming jesus and this actually underneath the covers here is a statement in the book of acts that jesus is god because you can't blaspheme against anyone but god and if they're blaspheming about jesus they're blaspheming about jesus is god a little side note so he shakes off the dust of his uh, of his garments in a sign against him says his blood's on your head I'm going to the Gentiles now what would be in Paul's mind at this moment what has happened every other time when he has left the synagogue and say I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles it's a common theme through the book of Acts that's when they start grabbing him that's when they start chasing him out of town that's when they start stoning him to death that's got to be in his mind. He's compelled by the Spirit to testify. Now he's kicked out of the synagogue. And now here he is once again with opposition. I do find it interesting that he does something kind of in your face. It says, did you pick up on that? He's going to go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there, from where? From the synagogue. And entered the house of a certain name, man named Justice. One who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he sets up, sets up church at the house next to the synagogue that he just got kicked out of. I'm kind of thinking the Jews that opposed him and kicked him out of the synagogue weren't real happy about that. And they weren't. Because later on, when a new uh, proconsul comes of Achaia, they bring Paul before him. But I want you to think about this because I want you to imagine yourself in Paul's shoes. All of these reasons for being concerned, all of these reasons for having his emotions just churning within him about being where he is and seeing what's happening. I've seen this happen before. And I was a failure in Athens. And I, I, I did just finally find out what's going on in Thessalonica and what a charge that would be. But this emotional roller coaster he's going through. And now the Jews are going to be out to get him. What's going to come in? Well, he's a man. Fear is coming in. Fear. Fear. What is the common underlying note or thread in fear for any believer, every believer, God's not with me. Perhaps that's fear of judgment because of stepping outside of the lines that the Lord has laid down for us. Maybe that's just not... I, I don't feel him right there. Maybe it's looking at a situation and saying, I've seen this before. I know what's going to happen. Or just dreading that something might happen. And why does fear come? Fear comes because of a, a lack of knowing. Oh, maybe we, intellectually we know, but feeling it strongly enough, the Lord is with me. Well, I, I don't know. And, and the enemy is just throwing out. Of course he's not with you. Of course not. You? Why would he be with you? Fear is inspired by the sense that we are not with the Lord or the Lord is not with us. And that's why. Notice what the Lord does for Paul. Verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. And here's what he said. Do not be afraid all right let's stop there for a minute and talk about that one all right i've tried this with people when they say they're afraid 
and I say, don't be afraid. Sometimes they say it out loud. Sometimes it's just rolling around in their head. Right, like I can just say, oh, okay, I'll stop being afraid now. Right? Fear is, obviously, we know through science and looking at the world around us, fear has useful things. Fear of burning your finger keeps you from leaning on the stove while you're cooking your breakfast, right? Fear of being burned and the knowledge and experience of the pain that comes, if you ever were kind of crazy and did that, right? So there are some good things about fear. And you cannot stop fear from enticing you, from coming. Notice the Lord says, do not fear. Now, anger is another emotion. What's the Lord say about anger? He says, in your anger, do not sin. It says the wrath of man never accomplishes the, the work of God. Okay. It, says, it doesn't say don't ever be angry. Don't be angry. It says don't sin in your anger. Here it says do not fear. Do not fear. So there is, there are two things to consider about this. Do not fear. If God says to you, do not fear, that means it is possible for you not to fear. God will not command you to do that which is impossible for you to do. He's a loving God. He's a wonderful Father. Oh, I know, with little kids, us fathers like to kind of tease and play with the kids a little bit and try to get them to try and do something that's impossible for them to do. And we kind of laugh about it because it's kind of funny and we're evil, adulterous generation of fathers and grandfathers. But that's not our Heavenly Father. He's not going to say, do not fear, and say, and I don't know, figure it out yourself how not to fear. So it means it's possible, and there's something else to consider. It means it's a choice. Now, when fear comes, usually you don't choose to be fearful unless you're one of those people that likes to be afraid, so you go to scary movies and you go to scary things at Halloween and all that kind of stuff, and I will pray for you. But when we're in a situation and fear comes, it doesn't come by invitation usually. So it isn't that the coming of fear is within our control, but what are you going to do with fear? What are you going to do with fear? When that fear comes, this is where you put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. I didn't tell you this one, but we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6 right now just to be reminded of what the whole armor of God is in practical terms. Or maybe in Sunday school you had that picture on the wall, the whole armor, or maybe you learned some songs about everything. But I find sometimes it's really important to think about it in very practical terms and very specific situations. So we'll walk through the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. Um, Starting at verse 10, and then we'll jump down, but you got to hear verse 10 first because it comes into play in exactly what I've been saying about the Lord doesn't command us to do something that's impossible. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, let's stop right here for a minute and let's apply fear to this whole situation. In the situation of fear, number one, the fear that is enticing you to remain in fear is a wile of the devil. If he can keep you fearful, he can keep your mind off of the Lord, except for the idea that you start praying, well, Lord, help me, help me not be afraid. What? I'm so afraid. And so you begin to doubt the Lord and the Lord's capability or your own faith or all that kind of stuff. And the devil just wraps your brain in circles around that. It's one of the wiles of the devil is fear. Second thing to look at is 
that you may be able to stand against those wiles. The wiles are coming, but you can stand against them. Right? Hey, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I find that there is no contradiction in the fact that the time that people like to, uh, in, like to get scared the most is around Halloween, where, where the world kind of envisions and idolizes goblins and weird, ugly things that in other contexts might be called demons, and so that that will make them afraid. And this is kind of fun. I like to get afraid. There's a connection there, and the connection is right here. We're wrestling against principalities, powers, spiritual forces in heavenly places, and those things would love for you to spend your life wrapped up in chain to some degree by fear. And I am here to tell you that Jesus came to set you free. He does not want you to be bound by fear. Fear not is a phrase that you will find throughout the Scriptures. It's not just New Testament. It's not just Paul. It's not just Jesus. God says it in Isaiah, fear not. And most often when He says fear not, the other phrase is there, for I am with you. I am with you. So what do we do when the fear comes? And we're like, but, yeah, but I feel the fear and I don't feel the Lord. I feel warm and fuzzy when the Lord is with me. Well, take up the whole armor of God and stand, therefore, girded, having girded your waist with truth. What's the truth? The truth is the Lord says, fear not, I am always with you even unto the end of the age. So regardless of whether you feel it at that moment, the truth, the light that will shine in that darkness is He is with you. He is with you. That's the promise of Jesus Christ Himself. So if He breaks that promise, then pff, let's just give up on His Christianity thing because it ain't true. The truth of the matter is, He will never leave you or forsake you. Oh, but I see the storms coming. I see the waves coming over the boat. I hear the wind. I see the storms. And Jesus was right next to you in the boat. That's what the disciples encountered, and they focused on the storm and not on the fact that Jesus was right there. Until they went, Jesus, you don't even care. We're going to die. Seriously? Seriously? Of course he cares. If Jesus is asleep in the boat, even though there are storms, why aren't you taking a nap? Why aren't you resting in the Lord in that moment? The truth, girded with the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. But pastor, I, you know, I'm not the most righteous person in the world. Of course you're not. None of us are. Whose righteousness are we girded with? The righteousness of Christ. Here it's called a breastplate in the context of armor. In another place, it's talked about a garment. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is an interesting one. You know what you have to do with fear sometimes? Run away. Run away from fear. Don't let it get, catch you. Just Keep right out in front of it. Keep running. With the preparation of the gospel of peace, yeah, put your shoes on and know what it says in Romans chapter 5. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the good news of the gospel. That is the gospel. We have peace with God. How was that accomplished? Well, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and the death and resurrection, and that's all the mechanics and the way that God brought it about. But what's the good news? We have peace with God. You don't have to be afraid of Him. Man, that's, that's the good news to the world. You don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to think of Armageddon as this horrible thing that might happen in my lifetime. Hey, you won't be here if you know Jesus. So don't worry about it. Right? Above all, taking the shield of faith which with, which, 
with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Three very important things. Shield of faith. So that stuff coming in, that fear coming to get you, boom. Uh -uh, Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, the Lord is with me. I not only know that and declare that by truth, I'm putting my trust in that. I am battling back against the fiery darts with my trust in the Lord. He has been with me that far. That's what we sang today. My Ebenezer stone. You look at that in the Old Testament. That was the concept of the Ebenezer stone. A a monument, a place where you could say, the Lord has been with me thus far. Man, we all have lots of those in our lives, don't we? The Lord was with me there. The Lord was with me there. The Lord was with me there. So He'll be with me there going forward. That's the strength of the Ebenezer stone. The shield of faith. The helmet of salvation. Keep your brains protected with the fact that you are saved because the enemy would like to throw fear upon you. Well, maybe you're not, though. You know, maybe maybe you did that that unforgivable sin. You know, maybe Pastor Kevin's not right that if you care about that, then then you, you haven't committed it. Otherwise, you wouldn't care. Maybe he doesn't really know. Maybe you're reading the Bible wrong. Maybe, 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 maybe. Stop, maybe. The truth of the matter is, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you confess Him with your mouth, you believe that He died for your sins and was raised from the dead, you are saved. The rest of it's the working out of your salvation that is the adventure of life and the joy of a life in Christ. But know it. Keep your brains protected. All right? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Resist the devil and he will flee. That's what the Word of God says. Oh. He won't just like take a step backwards and keep fighting. No, he will flee. He will flee. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the fear comes, get dressed. Don't go try and deal with the with the fear without your armor on. It's like going to play professional football in a swimsuit. Not a good idea. Because you're right down there on the front line. But with the full armor of God, man, it's there. And fear cannot take you. Back to Acts chapter 18. So he says, the Lord says to him, do not be afraid. But, okay, instead of being afraid, do this. But speak and do not keep silent. I wonder if maybe Paul heard this also when he was sitting next to Silas in the Philippian jail. Paul, hey, don't be afraid. I got you covered. Could you sing number 29 in the hymnal, verses 1, 2, and 4? You know, they're they're singing and they're giving praise. You know, some of the most important times to sing praise are in the times when you feel like it the least. Not just when joy rises up in your heart and you're just, man, the Lord is so good, i got to praise Him. But in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the difficulty, in the darkness of what's going on, declare His praises. Put some musical notes to it. Either way, declare it or sing it. Or get out your timbrel and dance. And declare unto the Lord your faith in Him. Paul, speak. Don't keep silent. He had finally, I'm going to testify about Jesus, not just try and reason them into the kingdom of God. I'm testifying. And the Lord says, yeah, do it. Keep speaking. That's exactly right. Yeah, you just got kicked out of the synagogue again. That's okay. Hang in there. For I am with you. 
And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And then what happens is when he gets pulled before the, the judgment seat is exactly the, what the Lord was speaking about right there. Well, yeah, they were out to get him. And yeah, they wanted to hurt him. But the Lord prevented it. No one's going to be able to accomplish that. And he doesn't even bring in, you know, the Christian army to save Paul. He uses a Roman proconsul or whatever he was, governor of Achaia. And it's very significant what this Gaius did because he was over a whole province. He wasn't just over Corinth. And what he was, what they were bringing the charge of the Christians was, is this is an illegal religion. They weren't talking about Jews and against the Jewish law. They were talking about Roman law. They're saying this is an illegal religion. So you need to get rid of them. And because Gaius did not listen to them and consider the case, he essentially set a precedent so that in all the other cities in Rome that they went to, there was this precedent that, no, this isn't, this isn't an illegal religion. It assumed it was legal. Now, later on, Rome did declare it illegal and started killing people for it. But it was a big deal. So he stayed there for a month and a half. There's something else that he did. Did you, did you notice the part about he got his hair done in Centria? Actually, he got his hair cut off in Centria, it says, because he paid a vow. What's up with that? Well, see, we're going to get there in a second, and I'm going to tell you my theory of why he took this vow was because of the Lord's encouraging of him because we talked about his his state of mind when he came into Corinth and now what happens he gets great news from Thessalonica the Lord's got him covered the, all the people that you are so worried about that you sent Timothy away from you so that you were alone in Athens they're fine they're fine and oh by the way Philippi it was at this point in time where the Philippians sent a gift to Paul so that he didn't have to work and keep tent making. He could go into full-time ministry in Corinth. Awesome. He could devote himself to that. And now the Lord speaks to him and says, Hey, I've got you covered, Paul. Nobody is going to harm you. Speak. Speak up. I'm with you. And I believe that was the inspiration for him to take the Nazarite vow. Because that's the vow where you cut off your hair at the end of the vow. So turn to number six. I told you we would get there sooner or later. Numbers chapter six. Numbers chapter six, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat any fresh, fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall, not, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation he shall be holy to the Lord. And if anyone dies very suddenly beside him, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head 
On the day of his cleansing, on the seventh day he shall shave it. On the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves, two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned in regard to the corpse. And he shall sanctify his head that same day. He shall consecrate to the Lord the days of his separation and bring a male lamb on its first year as a trespass offering. But the former day shall be lost because his separation was defiled. Okay, let's stop here for a second. It's a little weird. Uh, probably none of you have taken Nazarite vow. But if you did... According to this, this is what would happen. Okay, at the time that you take that vow, you consecrate to the Lord. The Nazarite, the word Nazarite means to be separated from. Literally, it means a vine that is, that is shaved clean, that, that has no branches to it. So uh, you separate it. It's a whole concept of being consecrated unto the Lord, being separated unto the Lord. And the way you live that out here, I don't know why. There's no grapes, no raisins, no wine, no vinegar, nothing from the grapes. Stay away from it. It's one of the reasons why Samson was trying to really walk the line on his Nazarite vow. He was a Nazarite because it says that he used to walk through the grapevines. Why would you walk through the vineyards where the grapes are growing if you're not supposed to touch them or eat them? Just so I could look at them and say, oh, I'd really like to have that grape, but I don't want it. Eh, not too wise, and yet we all do that sometimes to our particular sinful ways. But anyway, okay, no grapes, no dead bodies. I'm okay with that. But in those days, of course, life was a little different about dead people and so forth. And it, but it was, you're not to be defiled by a corpse, even to the point of you can't go to your mom or your dad's funeral, your brother or your sister's funeral. And oh, by the way, if somebody, you're sitting somewhere and somebody dies sitting next to you and you touch them, boom, that's it. Cut off your hair and start over because all the time that you did the vow at the beginning doesn't count. Wow. Why? You know, it really has nothing to do with dead bodies and grapes. It has to do with being separated unto the Lord, consecrated unto Him alone. And it's, it's the way that the Lord within the law said, okay, you want to really consecrate unto me? Here's what you do. Stay away from grapes and raisins and wine and vinegar. Don't cut your hair. Stay away from dead bodies. Now notice what happens at the end of this. Um... Let's see, uh, verse 13. Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought, brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering, one ram without blemish as a peace offering, offering, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers, anointed with oil, and their grain offering with their drink offerings. I'm pretty sure that's every category of offering. Now, the different categories of offering have a lot of significance. The burnt offering, in the burnt offering, the sacrifice was completely consumed on the altar. Nobody got to touch anything. Nobody got to eat anything. There was no feasting of it. It was totally consumed because it was about being fully consecrated unto the Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm dedicating myself fully unto you. The sin offering... The uh, parts of it were eaten, but it was, it was to, it, the blood was poured out and it was to atone for sin. Then there is the peace offering, which actually you got to eat part of, and it was kind of like the concept of having a meal with God. It's the same thing with the grain offering and the drink offering, that it was, it was taking what we have, what, what is not ours, we didn't make the food, maybe we cooked it, heated it up, chopped it up, whatever. We didn't make the food, and we offer to God, and it's eating in His presence, this communing with God. But this is the whole enchilada. This is every particular thing which is significant for the Nazarite vow, because it's about saying, I consecrate myself fully, and totally to you, Lord. And at the end of it, you shave off your, your hair. You keep it in, in this, in the days of Moses, when the tabernacle was there, they would actually go to the, uh, to the tabernacle itself and shave their head. And then the, the hair would be offered in the fire of the, of the offering. I think the burnt offering, but one of them. 
And that was the end of the vow. For Paul, what he did was he cut off his hair in century. I don't know why he picked there. The Lord spoke to him about it, I guess. And that was the end of the vow. I think it's because that's when he was gone from Corinth for that trip. And I believe that he started that vow, though the Scripture does not say this, but I believe it makes sense that he started that vow when the Lord spoke to him. He said, Paul, I'm with you. I'm with you. Are you with me? You're going to speak up? Yes, Lord. And here's Paul. This, you know Paul. Radical. I'm going to follow you to the end, Lord. And I believe it was that moment that he took the Nazarite vow. Now, should we take Nazarite vows? Not according to this. But should we take Nazarite vows? Yeah. Yeah, we should. Why should we not? Give all that we are and all that is significant to us unto the Lord for what He has done and who He is. Just like Psalm 150 said, I praise you because of your acts and because of your goodness. Because of who you are. Has the Lord worked in your life? Has the Lord done for you? Are you in the midst of of a circumstance where you are surrounded by the storm, maybe, but you've got Ebenezer stones in your rear view mirror that you can say, but the Lord was with me there. The Lord was with me there. Then I would challenge you, encourage you, I'm not a prophet, I'm not commanding you, take a Nazarite vow and consecrate it as you determine before the Lord. Okay, stay away from raisins and grapes and wine and vinegar. That works. Okay. But something that is a sign of the fact that, Lord, I'm doing this not to gain your favor. It's not what this is about. This is not to atone for your sins or prove to God how good you are. If that's why you want to take a vow, don't do it. Because God will, it's just not right. But to say unto the Lord, Lord, you have been with me. Lord, you have given me. Lord, you have provided for me. And in this, I want you to know, Lord, that I'm going to follow you in everything. I'm going to love you with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And here is my offering. It's not a sin offering. You've already been freed of your sins. It's a consecration offering. It's a burnt offering. Maybe for a time. Maybe forever. But let that be one of those things that you see in your life to say, you know what? This is, this is, I'm following the Lord in this. And whether there's an outward sign that you attach to it, which I think actually can be a good idea, or not. We all should be Nazarites before the Lord. He provides. You feeling afraid? You feeling bummed out? You feeling depressed? You feeling like whatever you're doing isn't working? You feel like people are out to get you? You feel like I just know the next worst thing is around the corner? I just know it. Look to Paul going into Corinth. That's exactly where he was. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Hey, speak up. I'm with you. No one. No one. And here I will say what the Lord says in another place. No one can take you out of my hand. No one. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your power and your greatness and your goodness towards us. For you, as we sang today, you are a good, good father. And Lord, we want to offer ourselves unto you. Lord, to be like the Nazarite, to devote ourselves, to separate ourselves unto you. So Lord, we ask that you would take this living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you, our reasonable service, 
that, Lord, we would continue to not be conformed by this world, but transformed by you, by the renewing of our minds. Lord, let us move forward in this journey of faith. And let us, like Paul, set aside all the encumbrances and the sin that so easily besets us and run with endurance the race, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We need you. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and grant you peace instead of fear. May he lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life. And that is through Jesus Christ who is our Lord, Savior, and soon coming King. Amen. Amen. God bless you.